Vedus glanced up at the grandfather clock that dominated the room, suddenly conscious of its steady mechanical rhythm. It was an ancient heirloom and his family's most valuable possession, though he couldn't understand why. It was hardly accurate, and had to be adjusted regularly to bear even a passing resemblance to their solar cycle. Even so, it told him it had been over five hours since his father had left. He had spoken to Ferus before leaving, and since then he'd been mulling over his words. The Explorator survivors have confirmed that the Splinter Fleet is heading for us, so you'll see less of me over the coming weeks. Ferus had read about the Tyranid. They were a hive mind composed of horrifying warrior organisms that existed only to consume and replicate. Although the guard primers he'd stolen from the top shelf of their library emphasized that though vicious, they were little more than mindless beasts, easily overcome by the tenacious spirit of man. How many are there? Ferus asked. I won't lie to you, we don't know. However, the shadow in the warp is unusually small and weak enough to have allowed our astropaths to get the word out. There's a chance this is a depleted fleet, coming for us out of desperation. He hesitated for a moment. There's something else, too. There have been sightings of a creature near Marble Arch and Rodney Way, possibly a vanguard organism. If so, we think it may be after me. Ferus had said nothing, noticing then that his father was wearing his Laz pistol holster unclasped. This isn't unexpected. The Xenos have been known to try this before. If they disrupt the chain of command, they might think they have a chance against us. I, however, don't intend to sit idle and wait for it to strike. I intend to hunt it down. The Emperor rewards those who confront his enemies. What if that's what it wants? Wouldn't it be best to stay here, to fortify our manor and the spire itself? I've made all necessary precautions, but if it's after me, this is the best way I can protect you. His father forced a smile. Don't worry, I've been preparing for this. Look after your brother while I'm away. He's not yet old enough to understand the call of duty. Since then, he had been playing with Otto on the dining room floor, awaiting his father's return. There was a seven-year age gap between them, such that his younger brother's play often strained his patience. He was engrossed in a game of toy soldiers between the folds of the carpet, the rules of which were a mystery known only to him. Every now and then he would glance up at Ferus, imploring him to join in, and he would move some figures unenthusiastically. The scaling bothered him. He had never seen an Astartes, but he was sure that the Emperor's Avenging Angels were relatively taller. Distracted, the clock impinged on his awareness again, and he got up to stretch his legs, walking around the grand table just to be away from his brother for a moment. He found himself in front of a bust of Lord Solar Macarius. The sculptor had done fine work. They'd probably never met him, but Ferus liked to think that they had. Otherwise, he thought they wouldn't have included his imperfections. He was, had been, just a man, like he'd be one day. He unconsciously raised himself up at the thought. A shadow fell across him and he turned, eyebrows curling in annoyance that Otto had climbed onto the table again. It wasn't Otto, however. His mind faltered, primal senses jammed by the sudden detection of lethal threat, unable to fathom the creature that stood mere meters away. It towered above him, claws outstretched, relaxed, almost beckoning. Mantis-like scything talons arched above, suspended with impossible insect stillness. Every fiber of its being indicated it was bred to kill, and yet it didn't move. Adrenaline crashed through his veins and his mind recoiled at every aspect of its presence. His floundering attention was seized by its stare. Deep set between chitinous protrusions, its eyes were small and unspeakably black. They reflected no light. Yet within them, Verus perceived a dreadful intelligence without sentience. A calculation that knew neither malice nor mercy. And yet it didn't move, standing before him with monstrous composure and an executioner's intent, appraising him. Its tail held high behind its head like a serpent poised to strike. Verus might have mistaken it for a statue if not for the questing tendrils that spilled from where its mouth should have been, writhing gently as if tasting the air. 
The shock of seeing a filament of the Great Devourer appear in such a familiar space almost broke him, casting his comfortable ignorance into hideous form. The pit in his stomach opened wide beneath and threatened to swallow him. All he could hear was his heart hammering in his ears. The grandfather clock struck the hour then, the resonating metallic sound shattering his paralysis. Amid coursing adrenaline, his cognition flooded back. He was no threat. If he was, he'd be dead already. No, the creature's intent was to instill fear, and that realization hardened his resolve. He remembered Macarius behind him, and his courage ignited. He remembered Otto, who, still absorbed in play, had yet to notice the intruder. He was further away, and therefore he had a chance. Otto! Run! To Verus's relief, his brother took one look at the monster and sprang up like a startled mudrat, sprinting for the east door and scattering plastic guardsmen across the floor. For a moment, the Tyranid didn't react, and then, still looking at Verus, it flexed its right claw. Verus noticed the fresh blood upon it, quashing any hope of aid from the household guard, and he immediately regretted his outburst. He felt a dull nausea enter him as he watched the predator turn away contemptuously, coiling its muscles. With silent, feline grace that belied its size, it leapt clear across the room, vaulting the table and landing in front of Otto with a deafening crash that shattered the parquet floor. It slammed its scything talons into the ground on either side of his younger brother, who toppled back in open-mouthed horror. Verus watched from the other side of the room utterly powerless as the courage reserved for his own self-sacrifice drained away. He expected the creature to carve Otto apart at any moment, and then he would run. Yet once again the organism paused, as if savoring death's approach. The clock had stopped chiming and had returned to its regular beat. It seemed like an affront that it should count away each second in the same way it always did. Slowly, almost tenderly. The Tyranid reached out a talon and enveloped Otto's face. He could see his brother shaking uncontrollably. Then it turned its head and looked straight at Verus, piercing him with his gaze once again. Its other claw snaked around Otto's back before raising him to its chest as a mother would cradle a newborn. He could hear his brother's muffled gasping sobs as its tendrils probed fiercely toward his mouth. Verus found himself running through the south door. He'd always been good at running. His father said he had sprinter's legs. He burst into the atrium and was halfway toward the main door before he remembered what was happening. He snapped a glance over his shoulder, expecting to see the beast ready to impale him. But it had not pursued. Then he remembered his brother. That might explain why he was running. To get help. There was no other reason. Comforted by this purpose, he ran on, but paused when his outstretched hand reached for the exit. He realized then that he was fleeing out of cowardice. There was no one to fetch, no one who could help in time, and if he left he'd be leaving his ancestral home, abandoning his only brother to a fate worse than death. He'd abandoned his brother. Behind him, he heard the south door swinging on its hinges and turned, but again there was nothing there. It was just settling after he had barreled through it. Then the main door opened violently, and he toppled over backward. The figure who walked through was recognizably his father, although he saw him as he never had before. Though he wore the same PDF uniform in which he had spoken to Verus that morning, he seemed larger. There was a hard focus in his eyes and an unyielding tension in his posture. He realized then that his father was prepared to die to protect his kin, and Verus's terror was compounded by shame at having fled. Armed men followed the general, flooding into the hall like water into a crevasse, covering every corner and shadow with the sights of their las guns. His father turned to him. You're in shock. Tell me where it is. Verus pointed toward the south door leading to the dining room. Go outside and wait with my men. Wait outside. The tone of command brokered no response. His father turned away, and with a signal his men formed up around him. Verus recognized one of them, Major Hawthorne, a distant relation who'd often joined them for dinner in the very room they were about to storm. At that moment a sonorous bellow rumbled through the empty manor. It seemed to come from all around them, above and below. 
It boomed down the stairs and echoed off the panelled walls for a long moment, filling Verus with dread. In a quiet, steady voice, Hawthorne answered, He is our shield. In unison, the soldiers completed the catechism. And our protector! His father remained silent. Despite himself, Verus's spirit soared as the squad surged forward as one. He watched, transfixed as they reached the south door, the lead man bringing it down with a savage kick. Verus followed cautiously, forgetting his father's order and daring to hope that he would see them slay the monster and save his brother. He didn't hear any last fire from the room beyond, which must mean the creature had temporarily eluded them. Yet they were the best his world had to offer. It was only a manner of time. They'd probably saved Otto already. Verus felt a sudden disturbance in the air behind him, and with a sharp intake of breath, panic finally overcame him. He felt a claw encase his head, a talon resting gently on the base of his skull as he was lifted bodily into the air. The monster shrieked and chaos ensued. The creature burst into the dining room, brandishing Verus before it like a ghastly trophy. Through the blood pooling in his eyes, he caught glimpses of soldiers frantically taking up formation to confront the new threat from behind. He heard men shouting, begging for orders, and imagined nervous fingers itching upon triggers. For a moment, he could just make out what he thought was the silhouette of his father, who alone stood motionless and silent. And somehow, through it all, he could just make out the unfaltering heartbeat rhythm of the grandfather clock. Or perhaps he was imagining it. The Tyranid screamed its challenge and leapt toward the firing line. Ferus heard his father give the order. Open fire! The fusillade of las bolts pierced them both, and the monster died without sound. Only Ferus screamed. Months later, Major Hawthorne gazed down at the corpse of his commanding officer. The morgue was cold lending him an unusual clarity. Every few minutes a quake from above dislodged a cloud of particles from the rockcrete ceiling, which drifted lazily in the air. Compared to the carnage of the battlefield, the harsh lights and equally spaced tables created a sense of order and peace, although the bodies were the same. The general had died leading a doomed charge to retake a forward trench in the southeast quadrant. Although Hawthorne knew, as had been plain to see, that he had been dead for months, defeated before he ever set foot on the battlefield. He dragged his men down with him. Hawthorne didn't have any children. He couldn't comprehend what it was like to lose two sons in a matter of minutes. But apparently the Tyranid did. They had supposed that the Lictor was hunting the general. But what if the foul creature had intended to untether his sanity by rendering him not only powerless to protect his children, but culpable in their deaths? and that had implications that troubled him. That was more than anticipating the behavioural patterns of prey. That was manipulating their psychology for a desired effect, which suggested a much deeper, more intimate understanding. Hawthorne had fought chaos cultists, those who cast aside the Emperor's grace and embraced the abyss, the decadence, the scheming, the rage. Yet even those warped, twisted vermin embodied a recognisable, though corrupted humanity. He'd fought Greenskins too, thankfully from a safe distance. It was obvious they barely understood fundamental human drives and more importantly, simply didn't care. The Tyranid were different. To have mastered human psychology so completely, and yet to deliberately omit it from their engineered bioforms, was more chilling than seeing his friends torn asunder. It meant the traits of humankind were no more than emergent properties of another biological process as transparent to the gene craft of the Great Devourer as any flora and fauna. It meant humanity wasn't divine. It meant he'd been lied to his whole life. He thought then of the Lictor, unflinchingly confronting its own certain death. How could it be the manifest destiny of the Imperium to rule the stars when this selfless predator of the Void judged human nature to be a weak survival strategy? His comrades had often told him he should pray more and think less. And perhaps they were right. Although for him it wouldn't matter for long, as another shockwave, the largest yet, spread cracks through the ceiling. Shaken from his reverie, Hawthorne wheeled the body of his friend into the crematorium. He paused over the activation stud for a moment, considering rejoining what was left of his platoon. They were probably making a last stand in Alexanderplatz, 
the kind of gesture he'd been taught was synonymous with glory. He wondered who was still alive. The idea of dying among friends felt good, but these were the predictable thoughts of a social animal. Herding grocs together made them easier to control, easier to extract their biomass. It would be a futile and selfish gesture. At least this way they would never see his meat, nor would they add his distinctiveness to their own grotesque gestalt. Hawthorne activated the incinerator and stepped into the flames.